Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Connectivity Through the Lens of COVID-19. We have muted all participant devices to eliminate the background noise so everyone can hear clearly. The view options on your screen can be adjusted to display all panelists by navigating to the view options on the toolbar. Select side by side for optimal view. Feel free to submit questions at any time by navigating to the QA option on the toolbar. Instructions on how to submit a question are being displayed on the screen. Thank you again for tuning in to today's webinar, and I will now turn it over to our experts. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Dina Foman, the first Vice President for Families First. I will be your moderator today. We will keep this to an hour. That includes Q&A. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to submit them. We have left some time at the end to answer those questions. First, I would like to tell you about Families First. Families First has been in our community for 30 years and provides child abuse prevention, health, housing, and behavioral health services for families whose life circumstances impact child and family health and stability. Many of the families served by Families First struggle with domestic violence, homelessness, drug or alcohol abuse, mental or physical health issues, or just a change in circumstances that has left them unable to cope. Families First helps them build on their strengths and designs individualized plans that meet each family's specific needs. Today, staying connected to the individuals, families, and communities we serve during this unprecedented and stressful time has been a priority for Families First. You will hear more about this from our panel speakers. How do we continue our life-saving work for another 30 years? That's simple. We created a foundation. Um, we created a foundation that was funded in 2015. Through our legacy giving program, supporters like you can join us. We have built an endowment so that we can continue to be sustainable and independent. Ultimately, our goal is to give another 45,000 children and parents an opportunity at a bright, safe, and healthy future. If you'd like to learn how to join our legacy society, and give a meaningful gift, please visit our website displayed on the screen. Today's presentation will focus on connectivity through the lens of COVID-19, specifically how our therapists are staying connected to the individuals, families, and communities they serve during the stressful time. This has been a priority for Families First. As we navigated through uncharted waters, our therapists are forced to discover creative ways to stay connected to clients in schools in order to provide mental health services. In addition, our clinicians provide information and stay connected with entire communities through a monthly radio show. You will hear from our three wonderful professionals, Patricia Goodrich, Joaquin Exume, and Vardine Simeus who are all on the front lines of the work being done by Families First each and every day. I would first like to introduce Dr. Bardeen K. Simeus, also known to her clients and colleagues as Dr. V. She has her PhD in Marriage and Family Therapy from Nova Southeastern University and a combination of 15 years of teaching and clinical. In addition to her clinical experience, Dr. V is keen at handling crisis such as individual such as suicidal ideation, abuse and neglect, and varying traumas that students experience in high school. Dr. V is also a host of a radio show that focuses on mental health treatments, domestic violence, mental health and suicide, just to name a few. Currently, she's employed as the Director of Social and Emotional Wellness at Families First of Palm Beach County, where she collaborates with administrators from secondary institutions. Dr. B will give us an overall explanation of connectivity and connectedness to set the stage for our presentation. Dr. B, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dina, um, and welcome everyone. 
Um, today, we're going to talk about connectivity in the lens of COVID-19. When we hear about this topic, I wonder what comes to mind. How do we stay connected? When the pandemic hit in March, um, March 13 to 2020, most of us decided, what are we going to do? How, because school was closed, I think, for the first time in my life, I've witnessed such a thing. Um, how do we continue to provide services to our family? How do we continue to reach out? What is connectivity? How do we stay connected? If we have no internet services, can students continue to go to school? Can we continue to provide te teletherapy? How do we maintain connection with our families? Connectedness, the state of being joined or linked, how do we support the families that we are serving? At Families First, families and clients and children are very important to us. So it's important that we came together to come about how we are going to stay connected with our clients. So at Families First, as clinicians, we create different platforms where we can provide services to our families. Having said that, we continue to connect with the students in the schools, and we're going to hear furthermore about how we end up reaching out to our clients, how we connect with them, how we continue to provide services to them, how we make sure that we continue to support them, families that lost their jobs, parents that couldn't find food, how do we refer them to places that were still offering food to family? Why is connectivity important? Connectivity is important. The more people feel connected, the lower their level of anxiety and depressions are. Um, and the more, the less supported people feel. Research have shown that their self-esteem is lower. So having said that, we are encouraging families, we are encouraging our staff or clinicians to be encouraged as well, to be supported, um, and that they can provide the, 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 that they can continue to provide services to our families. And therefore, we continue to maintain connection with our clients. We provide services to them. We, um, sessions that we used to do, such as Parent Connect, um, individually, um, students continue to receive services, or clients continue to receive services, or families continue to receive services to Parent Connect. And, um, and to the radio show, the community continue to be reached out. We continue to inform them about different ways, different approach that they can use with their kids during COVID-19, how they can stay safe, how they can continue to maintain connection with their families and as well as with the community. Thank you for giving us that overview, Dr. B, and we will hear from Dr. B a little bit later. Now I would like to introduce Patricia Goodrich. Patricia started her professional career as an artist. She was the director of the Children's Readers Theater Program in Lake Worth, teaching children and youth how to express their emotions through art. Patricia now has her master's degree in social work and has been working clinically with children and families since 2012. Prior to working for Families First, Patricia worked with survivors of childhood sexual abuse in a trauma program. Ms. Goodrich is currently working at Families First with teens and adolescents in an alternative high school in Palm Beach County, where she provides therapy as well as training and support to the staff of the school on how best to assist the student to reach their fullest potential. The floor is yours, Patricia. Thank you, Dina. Good afternoon. So you will be hearing a lot today about connecting, connectivity, and connections because it's what we do. As social workers and clinicians, we connect. We connect our families to resources. We connect our clients to supports that assist them in building positive and healthy relationships and connections in the hopes um, that they will gain a sense of belonging, being visible, being heard. We also assist our clients in connecting to their inner resources and their strengths and provide knowledge and tools that we hope that they can use um, to make the changes that they're wanting to see in their lives. So typically, we do this in person and face to face. In our offices, we go to the clients' homes, we're in the schools, and we're in the, and we're in the aftercare centers. And that's how we make the connections, the essence of what we do. And I love this quote by Brene Brown, connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, 
and uh, when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. So because of COVID-19 now, we have to change the way we typically practice and have to now rely on technology. But we have to do that without losing the essence of how we make connections. So in order for us to maintain our connections with our clients and to create new connections with people that we may be able to serve, we first have to have access to our clients and they have to have access to us. And many of the families that we serve do not have the resources or access to resources. And when the schools closed in, April, in, the, in March, in the spring, as clinicians working in the schools, we worked we worked together with the principals and the assistant principals to ensure that the students that we were working with um, got connected to obtain the technology that they needed from the school district in order to finish school and to work with us as well. And we also assisted their families in getting connected with internet access. And on March 17th, HIPAA regulations were eased so that any private communication programs such as Skype or FaceTime we could, could be used as a viable resource in, in order for us to meet with the clients. And this broadened our access to our clients and, and their access to us um, tremendously. And so while we were figuring out our platforms and how we were going to do this, we were still able to be connected with them um, and still try to um, secure their confidentiality and their privacy as well. So the school district uses the Google Classroom platform and Google Meets. And so when the schools closed last spring, and I'm you know, not super tech, techno, technologically savvy, so I was wondering how am I going to engage with these students virtually? I mean, what I do now is I am in the halls, walking down the halls at the changes of, of the classes, and I say, hey, and hi, and we make eye contact, or during lunch, I'm in the cafeteria or on the patio, and who's sitting with who, and who's not sitting with anybody, and what's the mood that's going on, and who hasn't been coming to school for the last couple of days, which may warrant a phone call home or a check-in. So I was wondering how we were going to do that. And then, so now at um, the principal's request, the teachers of my clients invite me into their classrooms so that I can make contact e either through a private message or I can see if they're absent too often. And this way I can kind of check in and see how they're doing that way. Another way in which um, I learned how to kind of make contact through technology was through Google Meets. And um, I met my clients individually on Google Meets, but I also met um, a group, a club that I um, facilitate after school. Um, once I kind of felt a little bit more comfortable on the platform, um, and when my, the club members started asking me when I was going to start my arts lounge again, um, I got my courage together and I restarted um, an after school club that I facilitate called the Arts Lounge. And um, we met like we usually do every Tuesday after school and that routine kind of really helped with giving the students a sense of normalcy, something to look forward to. And we just hung out and we talked about what was on their minds. We shared, they shared the artwork that they were doing at home with the materials that they had. They shared rap songs that they created, games that they were creating on the internet. Um, and we even played a few improv games. So, and then another way um, we're using technology to connect is um, a counseling classroom. So at the school, I'm part of a behavioral health team. And last spring, we created a counseling classroom for not only our clients that we were seeing, but other students in the school and the staff and the administration were all invited um, to participate in this classroom. And it turned out to be a really wonderful resource for not only our clients, but the entire school. Um, we posted resources, we posted videos, um, uh, explaining, teaching about the benefits of deep breathing along with a video that showed um, how to deep breathe, to do deep breathing exercises. 
gratitude journals, two on one team guide, um, and, it's, and inspirations of the day. It got to a point where students were contacting me wondering um, if I would post their inspiration of the day. And then what that did was that created um, the teachers commenting and encouraging the students to do the same. So what was happening was that we were, um, uh, we were creating a really safe place where teachers and staff were encouraging students and we were encouraging each other and hearing our voices and lifting us up in a very um, uneasy time. So although we were not in the same building, uh, we, we, we remained a community supporting the students and each other. So we were making really meaningful connections on an individual level, in a group level, and throughout the entire school. So there's another form of connection that I think is important. Um, and that is the connections and the relationships that exist between the clinicians and the staff and the teachers of the school. So being a co-located therapist at the school, that gives me uh, the opportunity to become part of the fabric of the school and to build relationships with the principals and the assistant principals and counselors and teachers. And at this time, while we're still distance learning, um, the teachers are essentially the eyes and the ears of the school. And um, I'll il illustrate this point um, with a little story. So last spring, I was struggling to make contact with a client. Um, and before I had access to the classrooms, his teacher reached out to me because um, to let me know that he wasn't attending classes. And um, it had been, this was a student that had been struggling quite significantly prior to school closure. So because this teacher warned me and I wasn't getting through either, we were able to come up with a plan. And so this teacher and I, who she also served as a translator for the student's um, parent, set up a three-way conference on Google Meets. And we were able to check in with the student and we were able to check in with the family and we were able to get this student back on track. So um, next slide, please. So what we discovered across the board is that um, communication, patience, and flexibility are key. No matter what the age, no matter what the, the grouping um, in school is. Um, However, after speaking with some of the clinicians working with um, students and the younger students in the elementary and preschool age, um, they shared with me that um, parent, um, because, because they're so much younger and they need more assistance, that the parent um, participation, parent guardian participation is key to any kind of success. Um, and routine and structure is, and is very important, especially during a time of crisis for anybody and everybody. And it's very helpful to have those routines and, and schedules, a set, a set session each week at the same time. However, flexibility is very important across the board as well. Um, and some of the ways um, these therapists um, shared that they engaged um, was to start off with an activity, start off the session with an activity because these little ones have a diff more difficult time sitting in front of a computer for so long. So if we get up and do an activity, a hand game or a dance to a YouTube song or something like that, at first it kind of gets them awake and ready to go. And then incorporate that in with your sessions and in, into the work that you're doing. Also screen sharing, screen sharing work or screen sharing worksheets that you might be using is also very important and very useful tool. So uh, in the high school where I am co-located, um, there are, is also like a middle school level as well. And so I work with these students as well. And the middle school students, you know, they're transitioning more into being more independent and a little bit more self-sufficient. Um, but you will send a, a text reminder, you know, about your session, you know, even maybe a half an hour before the session begins. And eight times out of 10, they're still going to, you know, kind of forget. And that's where your patience has to come in. And that's where your um, flexibility has to come in. I know there are boundaries and we, we need to set those boundaries, but these are different times and difficult times. And especially during that crisis time, it was kind of important to kind of 
leave that, be a little bit more flexible with people. Um, and along with the high school students as well. So uh, a, a lot of the work that I've done with, with these two age groups are um, adjustment, working to adjust to the new situation, um, reducing anxiety, um, and accepting what they have the ability to change and what they don't have the ability to change. And um, that was very important. Um, and for the high school students, the same, the same issues were being used, um, but there was an added level of stress. Many of the high school students um, were working and maybe, and a lot of them, some of their jobs, what their family needed them to have that job. And so therapy kind of took a back seat for a while because you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs therapy wasn't in there right away. So perseverance was important to keep tapping that person, sending a text, sending an email. Hey, I see you, I know you're here, um, and I'm here too when you're ready. And um, for me, it, it worked, uh, it worked, that perseverance worked for several students and they actually joined in later when they were ready and when they had their needs were met at home. And so that was very important um, to keep in mind. And so I know that, you know, we've, we are five and a half, six weeks into this and that um, we are developing, we are developing um, our skills and we are coming more proficient at things. And some of these things are going to become our new normal and we're already adjusting to that and that's great. But things are constantly changing and so we have to uh, move with that as well. Um, but the thing that doesn't change much is our connection. And a, a text for, to a student that is struggling with social distance learning a good morning will work wonders and it will go a long way for that student. And so, and so this brings me to this quote from Dr. Bruce Perry, which is the most powerful buffer in times of stress and distress is our social connectedness. So let's remember to stay physically distant, but emotionally close reach out and connect. Even a short text or smiley face on Zoom can help. And I think that is even more important now than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That was a wonderful presentation. Kids of all ages desperately need therapists like you to get them on the right path and to stay focused. We will now go back to Dr. B, who will present on making connections with individuals and families outside of school. Thank you, Dina. Um, with this COVID-19, our families experience a lot of tragedy. tragedy. Um, strengthening families through making meaningful connection with them was very important for us at Families First. Um, most of our families lost parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts. So there's a level of despair that those family experience. And at times it was hard to connect with them. Um, some of our families, I remember this particular um, client where his father got deported to the midst of this um, pandemic. How devastated he was and how the school could not connect with this client because um, he was not going to school, he was not attending school, and how we had to maintain connect, put connectivity with him, how we had to stay connected with the parents, helping them to understand the importance that, granted he was in distance learning, that he was still in school, um, providing um, services. So family therapy was really important to provide to that family to get that student um, connected back in the community, back with the school. So family therapy is a one way to promote connectedness with the family system. And um, family connectedness is also another 
approach where we use a particular characteristic of the family bond. Um, also, it's referred as a family or parental closeness, support, warmth, or responsiveness. And for this one case, and the reason why um, it came to mind, um, it's because the principal, the guidance counselors, the BHP, um, myself, including the therapist, um, receiving weekly supervision and trying to stay connected with that family, providing service, uh, a lot of psychoeducation to that mom, making a lot of referral to legal aid services, making sure that mom had food, that um, their light were paid for, because that was the men breadwinner. So our families, our parents, or our clients, or students were highly impacted with COVID-19 and providing that support to keep them connected was very important. Um, so during a crisis or a tragedy, family connectedness is even more important to focus on. And why that is, because like I said, for this family, there um, were illegal immigrants who did not speak the language, who needed to have the appropriate um, person, the appropriate staff that could connect with them, that could guide them, and that spoke their language to actually help them and assist them. Um, considering pre-existing bonding issue prior COVID-19 to highlight needs and parent-child bonding, and this child was also behaving in ways that this parent could not understand because this child was mourning his father, mourning the fact that he was very close to his dad. His dad um, got picked up um, and was detained and got sent back um, to his native country. How devastated that was, how mom could not connect back with this kid, helping that parent to understand um, the grief, the grieving process that this child was going through was very important. Not just connecting with mom, so connecting with mom as well as connecting with this child also help them as a family to connect with each other, understanding that yes, you're mourning, yes, for mom, he was being disrespectful, but yet allowing mom to understand, hey, the way um, he's mourning, um, her yelling and screaming and finding ways for this kid to connect with him was not gonna work, but how could he, uh, mom meet this child halfway so that she could connect with him, so she could understand the stressors that he was understand that he was experiencing, so that she could really um, connect with him and love on him as she did. Um, so family therapy became very key, became a focus where we promote com connectedness within the family system. Um, next, and I think Parent Connect. So Parent Connect is a platform that was created by Mr. Exum Exume. I did that purposefully. <laughs> um, so when I came to Families First, Parent Connect became a platform where we provide workshop to families. And those workshops were psycho are psychoeducational, where we provide myriad of educations to families um, based upon mental health, um, understanding the stigmas of mental health, understanding how to access services in the community, and the goal really of Parent Connect was to connect parents with one another. How do we get parents who are experiencing different difficulties or similar difficulties to connect with one another? So when those parents are connecting, so they don't feel like, oh my God, I'm an immigrant, I don't belong in this country, or either I'm an American, I don't understand my child's behavior, I don't understand what's going on with the school, the teachers keep calling me, um, and parents get really frustrated every time the phone call and sadly to say, most of the time when a teacher calls a parent, the news is not always great. It's always like, can you talk to him? We're gonna have a conference and it's highly stressful. And how do we get these parents to understand the dynamic, the system, the, the, the system, the school system, and how do we help them to navigate that system? So we provide education to the parents. So we work with agencies, we collaborate with different agencies that also bring in educations to those families, such as the legal aid system. How if a child has a 504 plan, do they understand what an IEP is? And how do they um, schedule meetings with the families? So we help them to understand mental health and its importance to interact with their children as well, such as if a child is autistic, if a child has any type of mental health behavior, 
if a child has even stress that caused them not to be able to test in the classroom, how do we assist them? How do we connect them with the school system and creating meetings and having a wraparound meeting where all the parties are sitting around the table to communicate in such a way where we are connecting this child with services that could benefit him or her. So in Parent Connect, another uh, methods we do, we teach parent parented skills, such as how do they engage in communication or even be in relationship with their children? How do they do that? Um, and we sit them in circle where we engage them as parents um, to even explore that so they know how to communicate with their child. Some of those parents experience multiple traumas as well. So not knowing how to enhance their relationship with their child. So we have them to revisit what was it like when they were children? How, did, how were they parent? So they could see um, what is it? I remember there was a question we asked in Parent Connect and I thought that was the most powerful Parent Connect that we had where we asked the parents to think about what their children are thinking about them as parents. How powerful it was because most of them couldn't really bring about an answer about what is it that my child think about me as a mother or as a father. And um, luckily um, in the Delray community, we have a lot of dads that do attend or Parent Connect and they, are, they're, they widely participate, so which is something I love. Um, and engage parents to understand the social emotional well-being of their children, how important that is. Um, in many cultures, we hear that children are seen and not heard. So how do we help their parents to understand that their kids have emotions, how they talk to their kids, how it impacts them, the words they use, how it impacts them, the action they do, either fighting in front of their kids, whereas there's domestic violence, how that impact the child, how that impact the child's learning. So they're not only understanding how their relationship is important, but also the relationship that their children are formulating with them is also important. So in another way, if Joaquin, you want to uh, jump in at any time um, to add anything on Parent Connect that I didn't add, you could please do so. Oh, that's okay. You're doing good. Um, so I think the main key for us in Parent Connect is not only bringing information to families about mental health, but also the child, the parent-child relationship, how important that is, how they are the helping parents to understand they are the most important person in their child's life, the person that is the most influencing um, voice in their child's life, and how they can build on developing positive relationship and connecting more with their children day after day. Dr. V, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Family and connections are vital to the health and success of each and every one of us. Lastly, I would like to introduce Joaquim Exume, a registered mental health counseling intern who secured his master's degree from South University. He had extensive training in trauma-informed care and is a certified as a trauma clinician. In addition to his current profession as a mental health clinician, Mr. Exume has been a journalist since 1990 working in Washington, D.C. When he's not in his therapeutic role at Families First, he works as a journalist and a reporter for a local radio station where he hosts on mental health and community awareness. Mr. Exume is currently a therapist with Families First, providing therapy to children and families, running parent support, group, support groups, and offering support to the staff and faculty of a local school and an after-school after program. Mr. Exume. Thanks, Tina. Uh, we have heard, of course, from my colleagues, uh, Dr. V and Patricia about how Families First is uh, framing uh, the kind of intervention that we uh, that are needed, if you will, to assist individuals within the school, for instance, and from a family standpoint to a focus uh, on family therapy and group meetings such as uh, Parent Connect. They like to call Parent Connect my baby, but it's our baby. Uh, so now let us um, see how the agency, how Families First is trying to level up its engagement 
at a much higher scale. So how does Family Minister switching out, you know, uh, to community to exemplify the kind of work that needs to be done to enforce and encourage the concept of connectivity? So without going back to the definition of, you know, this ter terminology or talking about its importance, uh, I guess we already have a, a six set idea about why such connection is important. So now let's get right to it. Uh, what does Families First is doing to reach out to, uh, for instance, the Asian community? Um, one thing that we are trying to do is to communicate and to communicate is also a guarantee for uh, connectivity. So uh, the first thing we try to do is to have that radio show. Uh, the radio show idea, um, actually, it, it wasn't originally uh, from Families First, but we are part of Families First. Of course, that idea actually is being uh, supported uh, by Families First. So it was uh, Dr. V, uh, I think she already had that idea first. And uh, I had that idea with uh, somebody else I was working on. And then we get together in our discussion and our ideas collide. And there you go, we created uh, the show. So at first, to have a show being host um, at a radio, local radio station, of course you have to pay. So we get it, it was uh, Dr. V, and we also had uh, a former employee here, a star. So all three of us, we get together and we pay for the show. Then families first heard about uh, uh, the show and they decided along with uh, healthcare district to support us and now we're not paying that out of our pocket. So basically holistic talk show, let's see uh, what the framing is. So it's a radio broadcast program in Creole mainly. Um, it's supported of course by Families First and the healthcare district the kind of platform we use, it's the 900 AM Radio Vision Novel for those who are very familiar with this radio station. And actually I think uh, it's being broadcast, uh, I think the broadcast is uh, reaching to, uh, I believe Orlando and uh, Miami from my last uh, talk with the radio management. Uh, we also um, do Facebook live streaming uh, at, but the show is running every Sunday, every Sunday. So what is it exactly? It's, we consider it as a bridge between the helping professionals and the Haitian community in the Palm Beach County. And the main goal actually is number one, raising awareness among Haitians, mainly about mental uh, health issues. So we know there is that stigma uh, not everyone would want to talk about certain uh, things that has to do with mental health, mental issues. So that was the main, one of the main goals. Also, we tackle the stigma associated with uh, those uh, mental health topics and other controversial uh, uh, subjects. Later on, we will probably go over one in particular, one subject, one topic we covered that was very controversial. Uh, very heated, and that's probably one that will stay in our head because the, the response was very, very strong. So uh, we also, as for goal, promote family relations strengthening, uh, which is something that is big. And as Dr. V uh, just explained, uh, in, if we do that in Parent Connect, so Parent Connect, it's more like um, a, more narrowed way to reach out to, co uh, to community, but the radio show is more uh, broad. So we do uh, almost uh, basically the same thing, but at a, let's say, higher scale. So uh, when we do that, mainly we try to maintain discourse with listeners, how we do that. We allow uh, the listeners to ask us questions, so we, we respond to listeners' questions uh, live, of course. Uh, or on Facebook uh, feed, like if they want to ask a question, they can always comment. Um, we provide resources, uh, resources that are available throughout the community to listeners. Uh, we also share helpful, helpful uh, tips to enhance uh, family relationships. 
and connection to uh, different uh, web breaks. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, something very important that I think we might have to make, uh, to put a little bit and faces on it, which is the radio platform. And perhaps we have agencies or agencies representatives uh, work here with us. So basically, I think one thing we can do actually is to encourage them uh, to do one thing, find a way to enhance that kind of connection that is so needed. And to the radio station, for instance, uh, we know in communities that are like for too long have been excluded from decision making in society, um, letting them having a voice, uh, give them some kind of voice, let their voice to be heard on local and community radio that can empower and mobilize, which is a key to positive social change. And now a days it's more important and we, we are talking about um, connect connection so that actually can be one of the best platform uh, we know that this platform can be a valuable tool to influence uh, individuals and groups uh, so that they can actually successfully uh, put pressure on government uh, making uh, policy changes uh, regarding vulnerable uh, individuals um, Radio also is, to me, a powerful tool for education. Uh, so you can educate and inform communities on all aspects of life, such as, uh, let's say, community needs, what they need, what, uh, community engagement, how they can engage uh, within that same community or with other communities, um, community participation in social contracts, uh, for instance, and one of the, uh, the example, uh, for instance, one of the, uh, the topics that uh, we uh, covered has to do with, uh, let's say, stress management. So we help them to uh, basically have like uh, basic information about those things. We address um, abuse or domestic violence uh, during the pandemic mainly, uh, how they can actually reduce a certain uh, possibility that, for that to happen, or if it's happened, how to uh, connect with uh, resources available so that uh, they can uh, empower themselves. Uh, we also have, uh, for instance, for this uh, crisis, basically, we put like a lot of focus, uh, focus on COVID-19 and how to manage that. Um, I think one of, the, uh, one of the latest we had, it has to do with long distance learning uh, with respect to COVID-19. We know many parents have um, a tremendous um, amount of stress they are going through. And through that kind of program, radio programming, we help them to assess what, are, what do they have available for them. We invite uh, uh, officials from the Palm Beach County School District to come on and then talk to them to explain them the process. And I think that, uh, you know, that, that's really help, help uh, them to understand what they need to understand when it's come to that uh, distance learning. And also, um, like I said earlier, a uh, radio station can be a very much powerful tool. So um, I know we're talking about uh, mental health in our show, but I separately have my show, which I do uh, politics in it. However, when it's come to a community, certain things can actually be extended. For instance, uh, one of the shows we had, uh, I think it was somewhere around, uh, if I'm not mistaken, around May. November 2018. Yeah, so uh, that was with, I believe, with um, uh, census. So we know census is important. So we have to empower the community to participate in such activities, in such um, initiative, because the, if they don't know the importance of it, and, and we also have some uh, feedback from uh, member of the community, thinking census would be something that has to do with immigration. They have so, so many um, disparaging information about it and they didn't want to participate. So having uh, people who know uh, how this works, having people who have the knowledge about the, uh, the whole concept, 
And you know, we have them in the show, having them to participate with us, that actually help the community to connect with what is reality versus a fiction. So uh, uh, like I said earlier, I wanted to touch base on one of our heated uh, programming. And I think that's what makes uh, this uh, initiative very much powerful. Um, there is a topic that like within Haitian and whoever is Haitian out there watching this, I know you may uh, agree with me in that. Um, what, when it's come to issue with uh, gay, lesbian, LGBTQ uh, community, uh, that aspect is so taboo in Haiti and here in this community, Haitian community, you can't even like say one word about it and show that you can support it. I mean, don't get me wrong, certain people may evolve and, un and be understanding of it, but uh, for the majority, it is a very tricky subject. So we did uh, get uh, to that part actually in one of our show and that was uh, epic. So I think uh, Dr. V actually, um, she was accused of being gay. She, they accused me of being gay. Like uh, they, they think it's because we are gay. So it, just to sh give you an idea about how heated it was, but that's not the point. The point is, when you have those controversial uh, uh, situation, you have to bring them. And there was a specific case that uh, pushed us to do that show in particular. Uh, particularly, uh, it, it mainly because I personally, uh, I've seen, I'm seeing clients, I've seen a trend. And that trend is something that has to do with, you know, um, sexual uh, identity crisis among many, many kids. Mm -hmm. So they are very, uh, you know, unlimited uh, and they don't know how their parents will address them. So we had to bring that uh, show actually uh, on the table and get the hit. And of course, it went well because we were able to uh, get feedback from them and successfully uh, put it out there. So if anything, I would say uh, anyone out there who wants to follow us, of course, uh, we are on 900 AM every Sunday. Uh, you can also go on our Facebook page for a holistic talk show. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, Joaquin. I, you know, as a uh, board member for a long time, I didn't know this was a thing. It's a very incredible uh, service that you guys are providing. And your presentation was definitely an eye-opener for most of us, I'm sure. Um, I will now open it up to any questions. I do think that there is one question. If anybody else has questions, I encourage you to submit them. Um, the first question that we have is, um, how do you deal with children that don't have a computer at home? And it's not directed to anyone in particular. So I guess any of the panelists that want to take that question. So I know um, working in the schools, I know the school district provides um, the majority of the students with a computer. And last year, um, or in, in the spring, a lot of the computers didn't have a camera. And I think this year they are, are providing uh, Chromebooks that have cameras on them. But um, even last spring when that happened, you know, if there was someone who didn't have a computer or there was only one computer in the, in the house, um, we would, because of the HIPAA easing up on the regulations, uh, we were able to have a session over the phone if that was the only thing that was available. So, um, so we can, with the, in the HIPAA regulations being eased up a little bit, we were allowed to um, communicate in ways that we may not typically be able to. So I know that, um, especially with my older high school students, uh, clients, using the phone was kind of a preferred way for them because even in you know in a living situation where there may be um, multiple people in the house you can walk away with your cell phone and go into an area that's private um, you can't necessarily do that with a laptop um, and so and i also found that um, by using the phone or talk, or having sessions over the phone especially with some of my uh, male clients they were able to open up more they're 
they're, they felt more free in, in being able to express themselves uh, without being face to face necessarily. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. But um, so that's, that's been my experience. I don't know about um, Dr. B or Joaquin. I would say uh, yes, not having a computer home, basically mainly uh, in this time, it's not really a, an issue uh, since most of the, the program that we use, they are like uh, uh, mobile friendly. So basically anyone can download the same, app, app, uh, the same apps of the, they use on their uh, laptop or computer mm -hmm. home on those uh, devices. So it, it actually, like um, Patricia said, and I have the same experience, for certain uh, clients I used to see um, in, in our home, uh, in a therapeutic home uh, in Delray Beach, um, I found that using the phone is more engaging. Uh, there is something with them having that kind of control over that device. And also they can be mobile uh, leaving that space where parents are there, they may be, you know, skeptical about talking uh, about certain things with their therapists uh, with uh, parents being present. They can be mobile, they can use it to go uh, right in, uh, in the yard or anywhere they want to go. So I think uh, not having a computer actually is not really a problem because most people now, uh, as safely say, have access uh, to a phone. I think for me, having a computer is really not a big deal um, because I find that at the beginning, um, a lot of the kids were logging in because the school system in the spring were given one computer per family. So a lot of the kids were accessing Google Classroom or Google Meet via a phone or a tablet. So it really um, did make a difference. Um, like you said, Patricia, as well as Joaquin. So it... Um, it, it really wasn't a problem. Even Zoom, for the parents, when they come to Parent Connect, they were connecting through their phone. So they were still able to um, maintain connectivity by using their phone or a tablet um, when they come to our Parent Connect show or even a holistic talk show, you know, they were still able to connect. So I think having a computer is really not an issue. If there are any other questions, if you could submit them now, uh, we have uh, about eight more minutes. So we'll give it a few minutes. And I think one thing I would like to say, Dina, for the audience that is listening, connectivity, um, I think I wanna mention, it's almost like in order for us to have, we have bones, we have muscles and I think connective tissue comes to mind when I think of connectivity. Neither can work without the other. Our clients may be able to um, live without us, but I don't think we as um, families first can live without our clients and the children that we service. So with connectivity in the lens of COVID-19, I think in families first, what we thrive in doing is to provide support and the framework, the structure such as providing family therapy individual therapy and counseling for the students in the school, I, I think that's where the connectivity or we become the connective tissue that is attaching to the bones. Um, so bones without muscle cannot function and a muscle without bones cannot also function. So I think in a sense, that's where um, anyone who's working out there with client, just remember you are important to your client as well as your client is important to you. And remaining connected to your clients and will impact them in some shape, way, form, or other. Let me not say it to you right away, but you will see the difference. So mm -hmm. I think uh, I want to thank all the participants for coming and uh, to continue making a difference um, in the lives of the children and the families that they are servicing. We have one other question, um, and this is to Patricia. Can you elaborate a little more on what activities you had in the Arts Lounge? Uh, in, in the virtual arts lounge, I'm assuming. So, so the arts lounge is um, in well in person and virtually, um, just a safe place for the students to kind of come and relax 
and um, connect actually and kind of um, be able to kind of um, goof around and have a good time. So some of the activities, um, it was very kind of open and, and free. Whatever they were bringing in is what we worked on because in person, I would have, um, when, when we were doing it in the school, I would have supplies and I would have things to give them in order to work on things. And um, so we were, I was taking their lead actually. So whatever they had in their home and whatever they were bringing into the arts lounge virtually, that's what we discussed, that's what we talked about, that's what we worked on. So one student, um, had been working on rap songs. So he shared his rap songs with the group. And another student, since he was at home and this wasn't something that he could bring to school, he was creating games on his computer. And so I'm like, here, show me, show me the game, show me the game that you created. So that's not something he could have brought into the school necessarily, but because he was at home and he was on his computer, he was able to show me that. And so and another student um, was learning how to do hair because she wants to do hair. So she showed us how to do her own hair, how she was doing her hair. So because I didn't have the supplies to supply them with things, um, they created it. They created the virtual space and we just kind of riffed off of that. Um, I did try a few improv games, which didn't quite actually work as well as I wanted them to, because that's my thing. I'm an actor, so, but um, I'm, I've, I've gone to some virtual improv classes to learn some skills. So, um, but that's kind of what we did virtually. Okay, well, I don't, let me, let me just make sure it looks like we might have one more quick question. Um, can the panelists speak to how they addressed cultural differences with respect to connecting virtually with the families they worked with? So just a, let's go to you first, Patricia. Um, could you repeat the question for me? Sure, can the panelists speak to how they addressed cultural differences with respect to connecting virtually with the families they worked with? Um, Oh, I feel awful. I'm not sure if I know how to answer this question right now. I, um, I'll jump in. So I'm going to pass it to someone else at the moment. Sorry about that. <laughs> and Patricia, don't feel bad. Um, most of the clients we work with, some speaks English, some most speak Creole, and um, some speak Spanish. So we we make sure that we have staff or clinician that are um, linguistically, um, that can linguistically work with them. And if we have a family that's working with a child, let's say for example, the clinician speaks only English or Creole per se, because we have that happen and the family speaks Spanish. Um, oftentimes I will go out with those um, clinicians. In some cases, I believe last week, we had a session where, um, Culturally speaking, we do address um, whatever that the client is um, experiencing by being respectful. Um, we respect each and every single individual clients that we have. And uh, we make sure that there is someone that is able to communicate with them in the language in which they um, speak or their preferred language. Um, if it's Creole, um, if it's French, if it's um, Spanish, or what have you, we do have clinicians that can actually um, work with that family and assist them accordingly. And so, go ahead, Patricia, it's okay. Okay, sorry, that's okay, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's okay. So, so my brain got back on track, so now okay, I can answer ahead, that question, sorry. <laughs> so, um, but I don't wanna cut you off. Okay, so if you want to go, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, so I will. <laughs> um, so um, during so during the protests, um, I did process with um, two of my clients what their experiences were for that, and um, and and we had to go easy with it because we I had to make sure that they were in a place where they were safe, they were in a safe environment, and that they had a certain amount of. Um, 
skills in place in order to help them through it if they started to um, feeling emotions that would dysregulate them. So, but we did process that and um, there was a certain, and there was a two very different perspectives and um, there was a certain amount of um, fear for her family, for her father. Um, she was in a biracial family um, and fear for him and what was going to happen. And so we had to really talk through that. We had to process through that. Um, and so, um, but I had been working with this client for a while. So there were a lot of, of skills in place already to kind of get her to a place where she could um, regulate her emotions and kind of be able to express herself. And then um, earlier, as I stated in my presentation, there's our teachers in the school who are available to translate. And so connecting with those teachers when I have to um, work with a, a family um, that their prominent dominant language is uh, Spanish or Creole, I go to that teacher. And in that instance, we used a Google Meets conference so that we could all connect together. So um, those were, that was my experience with that. So, and thank you, Vardeen, for letting me knock you off. <laughs> so, okay. well, do you have anything to add quickly? We got just, we're about it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would say uh, mainly adding to uh, what Dr. V and Patricia just uh, said, I would say um, cultural sensitivity, I would add to that uh, because with uh, that sense of uh, understanding where that family come from and uh, what type of uh, way they have to interact. Certain families may not be uh, tech savvy and computer can be a big deal for them. So a therapist has to understand that part, not to be too frustrated, frustrated and feel like um, that family may not be engaging. So we have to be very much understanding. So uh, I think um, at Families First, our therapists are very well equipped in that way to show that understanding uh, towards uh, parents, and that can be uh, the first step to uh, connect with them culturally. Great. Well, thank you all for being here today. This was very insightful. We'd like to ask that you please save the date for our upcoming Children's Day Luncheon. This year we will be going virtual and registration is free. You will enjoy a wonderful musical performance, compelling family stories, and some amazing speakers, including our keynote speaker, Commissioner Mac Bernard. You can register by visiting our website at familiesfirstpbc.org. And with that, uh, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you.